take your Bible and go to Genesis chapter 2. Just a little testimony about soul winning Thursday night. Um, I, when I go out, I go, I go out as a Christian. I don't go out as a pastor. I go out as a Christian. And, um, but anyway, uh, I always pray. I'm praying during the week, Lord, take us to somebody that's ready that's right. to listen, that's ready to hear the gospel. And so, anyway, it was such a, 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 an amazing thing. Again, it happened Thursday night. But after witnessing to them, they, they said to me, can we do that right now? Can we take care of that right now? Amen. I love it. Amen. I love it. Praise the Lord for that. It's exciting to be a part of that. Amen. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Let's all stand out of respect to God's word. We're going to read there and also Psalm 8. And then we're going to go to Mark chapter 8. Genesis 2, 7. And follow along with me as I read. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Let's go to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mayest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And then go to Mark chapter 8, where we read a couple verses there. Mark chapter 8, and verses 36 and 37. Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. Mark 8, verses 36 and 37. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's pray, Father. Thank you again for the word of God. Thank you for the truth we're going to talk about this morning. Lord, help us to rejoice in it. But Lord, help us also do our part. Uh, we're going to talk about some amazing things. But there is also things that you have done. But there's also our part in this. So help us be willing to do our part, to see our part, and to do our part. We ask you, Lord, if there's anybody in this building that does not know for sure they're going to heaven, some, some may be sitting here in this room or downstairs in junior church, help them to see clearly that they can have the amazing, amazing gift of eternal life if they'll just come to Jesus on his terms and be saved. Lord, I pray you work in every Christian's heart here for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I'm glad we sing about things that are real here. Uh, wow, it's so real. I, I can't remember before I got saved and going to church, and really, really, truly believing, really, truly believing some of the things that were said. I mean, I believe the basic things they said, but some of the things that were said. In fact, I couldn't even tell you half the things that were said because I wasn't really paying attention. But um, this stuff's real. It's like Paul said, we're not talking about cunningly devised fables. We're talking about real things. We're at, we are going to stand before him one day. And, uh, and we are going to be rewarded according to our works. And I hope that you, yourself are taking that seriously because it is really truly going to happen and it's supposed to be an amazing awesome incredible day for you a day that you have never even come close to spending a day like this that's how good it's supposed to be so don't miss out on that don't miss out on that at all i want to talk to you this morning on the subject god's investments in you shows you are worth a lot god's investments in you shows you you are worth a lot let's pray father thank you again for the truth. Thank you for the reality of what we are, are doing right now. Uh, this is all real. This is all, this isn't religion. This isn't make believe stuff. This stuff is real. And we're grateful for that. Lord, I feel sorry for people that don't believe this stuff. I don't, they don't believe the Bible. They don't believe you. They don't believe in going to church. I feel sorry for people like that. And Lord, I'm so grateful that you have done a work in my life and you're just an amazing God. Please continue to work in me right now, continue to work in all of us. Again, if somebody here does not know for sure they're going to heaven, they're not a part of God's family, they've never been born again, help them to see that they can do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> in Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37, we read where Jesus said, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Question. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Another question. So he asks two questions in these verses. And he says, first of all, what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and loses his own soul? So what, <clears throat> what, benefits, uh, what benefit is it to, to you if you have everything in this world 
You name it, you had it, but you lost your soul. You lost your soul. You are a soul. Genesis 2 7, we just read that. God breathed into man and man, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So you are a soul. There was a time when you weren't around before you were conceived, but there never will be a time when you won't be somewhere. Do you ever think about that? There'll never be a time, ever, in all eternity, where you won't be somewhere. You either will be here on earth, and then in heaven, or hell. So what could you lose your soul to? You could lose your soul to things that don't matter, or won't last past this life, and eventually you would lose your soul to hell in the lake of fire. God is not willing for that to happen to you because of how valuable you are to him and how much he loves you. Second Peter chapter 3, uh, we read these verses, that, this verse, this truth that God said, uh, told Peter to write down. The Bible says here that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his longsuffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The second question Jesus asked in Mark chapter 8 was, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If someone had control of your life, Satan or God, what could you give to get it back? Well, the answer is nothing. Nothing. Satan wouldn't take anything from you for your soul. He wants it. If he had your soul, he w- you could not go to him and say, I'll give you this if you give me back my soul. He, doesn't, he, would never, he wouldn't take anything for it. He wants your soul. He wants your life. Understand, if you're not saved this morning, Satan wants you in hell. He wants you in hell. And he'll do everything he can do to make sure that happens. If you are saved this morning, he can't take you to hell anymore, but he wants your life. He wants to take control of your life. He wants you to to turn away from the Christian walk and go his way. Just like Peter, when Peter cursed and died to the Lord, Satan had control of him for a while. In other words, Peter was doing what Satan really wanted him to do. God didn't want him to curse and deny the Lord. Satan wanted him to do that, and and Peter did it. Now, the same with God. God doesn't doesn't want... Anything you can give him, he wants you. All right? Are you listening? He wants you. He doesn't want what you have. He wants you. Okay, that's more important to him. You. Now, these two questions show us how valuable, how precious we are to God. And we are very important also to the cause of the devil. Now, but more importantly, more importantly, we are very important to the cause of the Lord. Now, I really don't, I mean, I'm not interested in the cause of the devil. I could care less about that. I don't want anything to do with that. I'm not interested. He can offer me whatever he wants to offer me. I'm not interested in going his way at all. But I am very interested in the cause of the Lord. And the Lord is interest, and very interested in me <clears throat> take, learning that cause and doing something with my life. Now, you may not think you're much this morning, but I want to tell you, you are. All right, you are. The truth is, Take all the money, now listen to me, take all the money in all the world, billions and trillions of dollars, and stack it up in a building, and add it up, and you're worth more than all of it. I'm talking about you. You, yourself. Now, I'm talking about you in plural here. I'm talking about you, singular. (coughs) You are worth more than all of the money in the world, all of it added up. Let's go a step further. Take all the material possessions of everyone on this planet and put them all in one location and you're worth more than that to God. Think about that. Then take all the material possessions and all the money and it all together and you're still worth more. You yourself, you singular, are worth more than that. You see, you are worth a great deal to God and more than anything in this world put together. As much um, or as much as me, you're worth to God or anyone else in here. You are worth really an amazing amount to God. God, now listen to me. God proved it to you by his investments in you. And I'm going to share those with you this morning. I want you to get a hold of that because there's people in this room this morning, you're wasting your life. You're just wasting your life. 
Uh, there's people in this room that, that maybe you don't think you're that important to God. You may look at me and say, well, he's more important to God than I am. I beg to differ with you about that. You need to get a hold of how important you are to God. Now, the investments I'm talking about this morning, he invested in me. He didn't invest in me as Pastor Richter. He invested in me as Mike Richter. That's who he invested in as. And he's same with you. See, I don't care who you are. I don't care what you, what background you come from. God is, thinks you are very, very valuable to him. Now, let me give you some of the, give his investments. First of all, he invested a plan of redemption. He invested, invested a plan of salvation to, for you. You think about that. Now, here's, here's the investment. First of all, the father gave his son for you. Go to John 3.16. John 3.16. The Father gave His Son for you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now that little phrase there, only begotten Son, that lets me know, uh, that says a little bit about how close they were, or they are, to each other. And yet God gave His Son for you. See, that what an investment. He gave up someone he loved so much. He knew when the, Jesus was, he came here to earth, even when he was that cute little baby boy, he knew what was going to happen to his son. He knew exactly what, there was no surprise. He didn't sit, he didn't sit there on the throne of heaven and watch Jesus go through that trial and through that beating that he took and the crucifixion. He didn't watch Jesus go through all that and say, well, if I had known that was going to happen, I wouldn't have let him come. He already knew all that. What was he doing? He was investing his son in you. Wow. Wow. Right there. I could stop right there. That'll make you want to give God your entire life. Just for that. Let's go on. Jesus gave his life for you. Go to John chapter number 10. John chapter number 10. Now I'm asking you again. When I'm talk, when I say the word you, don't make it plural. It's singular. I'm talking to you. John chapter 10 and verse number 9. The Bible says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. He, by the way, he didn't say, I am a door. I am one way to heaven. He didn't say that. He said, I am the door. I am the only way people can be saved from hell and go to heaven. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come they might have life, that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, his own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hiring fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep." I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know I the Father, and I lay down my life. I lay down my life for the sheep. Now the sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I, I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, for, that I might take it again. Now watch this. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received my father. Jesus invested his very life in you. He gave up his life. He knew as he was walking this earth, as he was going around preaching and teaching and healing and helping people, he knew some of the very people he was trying to help were going to put him on a cross. He knew what was going on. He knew it but he gave his life for you. What an investment. That there ought to make you say, you know what? When I, before I walk out of this room, I'm going to get on my knees and give him complete control of my life. Because he deserves it. Yes. The Holy Spirit, he gives his time and effort to you. He's one of the, he's the forgotten part of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but he, he gives his time and and his effort to you. Hebrews 13, 5, the Bible says, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. John 14, 26 says the Holy Spirit is going to teach us all things. He gives his time. He spends 
24-7 with me every single day. And he's, he's there. He's inside me. He's working with me. He's teaching me. He's putting up with me. He gives his effort, 100% effort he invests in my daily life. Wow, that's amazing. And all had to do with this plan of salvation that God developed and made just for us. That's amazing. That plan of redemption wasn't for the animals. It was for us. It was for us. The ones that were going to be sinners. He came, he, he came through for us and did what needed to be done. He invested a plan of redemption, a plan of salvation for us. Second thing, he invested in you <clears throat> to make a plan and a purpose for your life. He invested in you to make a plan and a purpose for your life. In Jeremiah chapter 1, he gives us an example, uh, uh, and he uses uh, uh, Jeremiah, the prophet, as an example. He says here, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. That's true of everybody here. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. That's true of everybody here. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, that's a preacher of the truth to the nations. Now, God's telling Jeremiah, I had a plan and a purpose for your life. Now, you can read all throughout the Bible. You go to Psalm 139, for example. You can read Genesis 2, the story of the first man, Adam and, and Eve. And you can see that God has a plan for each one of us. He has a plan and a purpose for our life. He didn't just stick us down here so he could have, we could, he could have a little play thing. No, he has a plan. And he has a purpose. I'm so thankful for that. How many times as a young man did I, before I got saved, did I think, I wonder why I'm here. What is this all about? What's the purpose of my life? Is this all there is? There's got to be something more to it. Thank the Lord God said, I'm going to invest a plan and a purpose. And after I got saved, he started working in my life and showed me that amazing plan and the purpose he had for my life. He has a path for me to follow. He has a way. For me to live. It's amazing. In Psalm Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, Trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. All thy ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. Jeremiah 6, 16, he tells us, Seek and ask for the old paths, which is the good way. I'm just paraphrasing. And walk therein, you shall find rest for your souls. He gave us a path. He gave a, a plan and a purpose and a path to walk. Now listen to me. It is a path it is a plan, it is a purpose that would bring us happiness. It is a plan, a purpose, and a path that would bring us joy. It is a path and a purpose and a plan that would bring us fulfillment in our lives. Psalm 16, 11, the psalmist said this. He said, that thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. In Psalm 27, verse 11, let's put it like this. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path. That's what the Bible says. In Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 18, <clears throat> the Bible says here, <clears throat> the Bible says in Proverbs 4, 18, but the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. And so we see clearly all throughout the Bible as he talks about a plan, as he talks about a purpose, as he talks about a path, he's talking about how he had this available for anybody that wants it. Listen, when I, if I, when I came to him and said, Lord, I want to know what your purpose is, what your plan is, what your will is for my life, he didn't say, well, here, what, uh, what's your name again? Uh, let's see, Richter? Yeah, okay, how do you spell that? Um, is it with an R, R, R I C K T O R or R I, no, I, sorry, C H T. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And he gets his file box out and he looks up, he says, okay, let's see, I'm almost done with it. And as soon as I'm done, I'll let you know. No, he didn't do that at all. He invested in me. He said, I, I've got a plan for this little baby being formed in his mother's womb. In the year 1955, I was being formed in my mother's womb, and God was planning everything out for my life. He invested in me. Wow, that's amazing. He thought about me. He had a plan for my life. He had a purpose for my life. He had a, perp a path for my life to walk. Wow, that's amazing. 
He is a very personal God. And you are very personal to him. He doesn't look down here and see just a bunch of ants all over the world. He sees individual people. He sees you. And he invests in you. You are very precious and valuable to God. The, f- the next thing he invests, not only a plan of, of, of salvation, not only a plan for your life, not only a path to follow, but you know what else he invested? He wrote a book of direction for you. He wrote a book, and he kept it pure all of these years. Amen. Just for you. Yes. Just for you. It's pure from all criticism. Being successful. It's pure from all arguments against it. It's pure from all attempts to prove it wasn't true. It's pure from all attempts to get rid of it. It survived all of that. And it's still going. And it's still perfect. There's not a mistake in it. And he wrote this book just for me. And he wrote it just for you. And he invested in it. He, He made it perfect. He made sure that we would have the pure, perfect words of God for every generation. That means, that means he was make, he made sure that little old Mike Richter raised in Niles, Illinois, a little suburb of Chicago. He made sure that he was going to have a perfect book that would tell him how to be saved. And after he gets saved, would tell him how to live his life where he could have peace we could have joy, we could have happiness, we could have fulfillment in his life. God did that. He invested in it and he kept it pure. Go to John 17, 17. John 17, 17. Again, I want you to forget about you as a plural word, but think about you as a singular word, meaning you yourself. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We have a book of truth. Folks, there are so many books out there that are written to, uh, about the philosophies and teachings of this world and, and everything that's going on in this world and what's right and what's wrong, all these opinions. But we have God's very words on it right here. The creator of the universe. In, who, in him, we live and move and have our being. We've got his words. Psalm, or Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 5. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 5. It says here, Proverbs 30 verse 5, every word of God is pure. Amen. He tells me in Deuteronomy, I'm supposed to live by every word. And then he tells me in this scripture that every word is pure. Psalm 12, 6 and 7, the Bible says, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. I wasn't part of this generation in Psalm 12, 6, when the scripture was penned down, but I am part of the forever generation. I am one of those generations in that forever that God says. And so I have in front of me the perfect, pure, Words of God that he wrote, that he invested in me. He wrote, he told the men what to write, and he made sure they said exactly what he said. They wrote down word for word what God said. And then when the translation of the of the Hebrew and Greek into the English language, God made sure the translators did not make a mistake when they translated it. So I would have, so Mike Richter would have the perfect, pure words of God. Amen. He invested in me. All of that. All that effort. All that planning. All of it. And he did it for you too. You see. And you know he gave it to me. Psalm 119, 105. Look at what it says here. Psalm 119, 105. What an awesome, amazing verse. The Bible says here, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Wow. That's what this book is. This book is an amazing, amazing light to my path. I don't have to ever be in the dark about anything. So I got this book right here. Wow, that's incredible. That is incredible. What security it gives us. What peace it should give us. What hope it should give us. See, wow, 
God invested in it. He made sure of that. He even said, he even wrote how, how amazing the Bible is. He even said in one Psalm, I think it's Psalm 138, I magnify my word above my very name. Wow. Isn't that incredible? I feel sorry. I said this, I mentioned this earlier this morning. I feel sorry for the Christians that don't believe we have a perfect Bible. What a sad, sad way to live. I feel sorry for the unbelievers who don't believe the Bible. They have to walk in that confusion, in that darkness. But I feel sorry for the Christians who are never taught that we have a perfect Bible. It's amazing. They, you know, there are actually, actually churches this morning where, where the, the pastor's up speaking out of a book and uh, called, he calls it the Bible. But the, the, the people sitting in the congregation, they have all kinds of different perversions of the Bible. I hate to call them versions of the Bible because they're not the Bible. But, uh, but they have all kinds of different perversions of the Bible. I mean, different ones. So if they all got up and read the verse in unison, they all be reading it different. You think they were speaking in tongues? You see? I'm so thankful that, that we're, we, we don't have that. We don't have to put up with that. It's not, that's not the truth. The truth is, every Christian has available to them a perfect Bible. Every one of us has that. If you've never learned the truth about the King James Bible in the English language, you need to, you need to, to ask somebody about it. You need to learn about that. It's an awesome, amazing yeah, yeah. thing. And it'll give you so, so much peace. It'll, give you, it'll just make you feel so good about reading the Bible. It'll help you to see how important the Bible is and how you ought to make it, how you can depend on it. You can trust it. You don't have to, and, and you don't have to, I'll tell you, I, I had a, a, I had a, a, ver, a King James Bible, and in the, in, in the footnotes of the, and I mean by footnotes is sometimes the, the editors of that Bible write their own notes about it. underneath the, the actual text of the Bible, they write their own notes, and, and I had a, 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 a edition of the King James Bible where the editor would write uh, about a certain verse on that page that they said is not in the original manuscript, so we don't know if you should have it. I would take that thing, before I knew better, I would take that thing and I, I would just cross off all those notes. I reject those notes. Eventually, didn't depend on that Bible anymore at all, <clears throat> the, the, the notes in that Bible. You see, I'm so thankful. I'm th- I don't have to sit there and think, oh, are they right? Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Oh, well, wait a minute, though. The, my immediate thought comes to my mind, well, if that verse isn't true, what about this verse over here? What about that verse over there? And they start doubting the whole thing. We don't have to live like that. God's not like that. God, we are precious to God. We are valuable to God. He said, I got a plan. I'm going to make a plan of redemption for you to save you from hell so you can go to heaven. And then I'm going to make a plan for your life and a purpose. And then I'm going to give you a path to walk on while you follow that purpose. And then I'm going to give you a book to guide you down that path to light your path. Wow, it's amazing. And then the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, he's investing in us. He's preparing a place for us. He's investing in a place for us for the future. John chapter 14. John chapter 14, the Bible says this. John 14. Jesus said this to his disciples as he was about to leave. Uh, He's about to be crucified. And then he, of course, uh, soon after that, he was going to go up into heaven. But the Bible says here, let your heart... Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are not are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. He's talking to each individual disciple. There, there, there is a group, but he's many, meaning for them to take it all as individually. Take individuals, take it personally. He's going to prepare a place for you. Right? It is an amazing place. An amazing place. Now. In Revelation chapter 21, it talks about a city that we're going to live in. I don't have time to read all those, those verses, but Revelation 21 is an amazing. You say, well, what's heaven like? What's the new Jerusalem where we're going to live forever? What's it, what's it like? Read Revelation 21. It'll give you a little idea of what's not there and what's there. It's incredible. And God is building this city just for me to live there. He's thinking about me, and he's thinking about you because he doesn't look at us as a group. He looks at us as individual people. And then he's in that city. He's preparing a place for me to live in. This, I'm excited about that because when I get there and it's time for that all to be done, he's going to take me over to my place and say, this is where you live. I'm not going to look at it and say, you got to be kidding me. 
But when we get to heaven and God shows us the place we're going to live in, 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 in the new Jerusalem where we're going to live, when all, all that happens, when all that works out, it all comes to place. When I'm resting in my the place, I'm going to be able to, to look at that and say, wow, this is amazing. This is incredible. And you know what's the best thing about it is? I made it worth it. I made it worth it. To go and prepare a place for you. Wow. And, and the way the new Jerusalem is going to be, the way our eternal home is going to be, all made just so I would enjoy it and just so you would enjoy it forever. That's amazing. Think about that. Oh, it, God is so good. He's invested in us. That's how that, that, your, your soul is so valuable to God, so precious to God. It's, it's unbelievable. What is man? Thou art mindful of him. And the son of man, thou visitest him. I mean, we see throughout the Bible how all of God's creation, how important we are to him. Why don't we get a hold of that? He's invested in us the plan of redemption. He made it for us, for you, for me. He invested a, in a plan and a purpose for your life and my life. He made a path for you to follow, for me to follow. A path that would bring us happiness and joy and fulfillment. He wrote a book called the Bible and kept it perfect all these years for you and for me. And now he's preparing a place for us, for you and for me. That's incredible. I wonder this morning, are you preparing to live there? Are you preparing to live there? Now, don't <clears throat> you think about that. Think about, I want, I, want, I want to go through these investments real quick and just see what you're doing about it. What are you doing about all this? The plan of salvation. His plan of salvation for you. Have you accepted it? Uh, you are sitting here this morning. You are either 100% sure you're going to heaven. And if you are 100% sure you're going to heaven, you're 100% sure you're going to heaven two ways. Either you think you're good enough to get there, you're convinced of it, or you're trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, if you think you're good enough to get to heaven, you're going against everything God said. Not everything I said, but everything God said. Because God said you're not good enough to get to heaven. Your, your good works won't get you to heaven. You're a sinner, and your sins have got to be paid for. And they either are paid for by you after you die, or they're paid for by Jesus before you die. It's your choice, right? <clears throat> or, or you're sitting here and you're saying, I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven. I have no idea. I'd like to know, but I don't know. Well, why don't you this morning, if you're in that position, why don't you decide you're going you're to come to Jesus? Let us take the Bible and show you from the Bible God's way to heaven. God's plan that he made for you, the whole thing he did for you, so you could go into heaven when you die. Why don't you let us take the Bible and show you that? You can do that in just a few minutes here. <clears throat> but if you've not accepted his plan of salvation, why don't you turn from everything else you're trusting in and look to see what he says? And, take, and look at the plan he invested in you with. Secondly, what are you doing about his plan for your life? What are you doing about his plan and his purpose for your life? Listen to me, Christian. Have you tried to find out what it is? I want to ask you this morning. Have you tried to find out what God's plan is for you? Have you tried to find out what God's plan is, what God's purpose is for you? Have you tried to find that out? You say, yeah, I have. I've looked into it, and I found out. Okay, are you doing it? Have you surrendered to it 100%? Thirdly, what are you doing about his path for your life? Are you letting him walk you down that path? Are you letting him guide you and take you down that path? Have you put your hand in his, so to speak, and said, let's go through this together. You lead the way, Lord, I'm following you. Have you done that? His path for your life. Or maybe you're running from it. Maybe you're running from it. What have you done about his book of direction and guidance that he's given you? Are you letting it light your way? Are you letting it light your way? And David said in Psalm 119, 97, he put it like this, Psalm 119, 97. <clears throat> he said, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Law, the law referring to the word of God. He loved the word of God. And David let God's word 
guide his life. Are you doing that? What have you done with his book of direction for your life? Okay, you say, well, I have a Bible, and I even have a Bible with my name engraved on front of, in the front of it. Okay, you have your own Bible. It's got your name in it or your name on it. But what are you doing with it? I hope it's more than this. Christians are supposed to do more than this with the Bible. I'm not supposed to trip over that either. A Christian is supposed to do more than this with the Bible. Bring in a church and sit there and open it up while the preacher's preaching. He's supposed to do more than that with the Bible. What are you doing with it? It's supposed to be guiding your feet, guiding your path as you live your life. Is it doing that? And then what are you doing about the mansion he's preparing and the city he's preparing for you? Are you preparing to live in it? Matthew 24, 44, therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. God told his people in Amos chapter 4, prepare to meet thy God. Are you preparing for that? Are you getting ready for that? So, don't sit here and think my life is hopeless because it's not. In Romans 15 verse 4, Paul said this. Romans chapter 15 verse 4, and there's probably people in this room sitting here this morning, you feel empty, you feel like your life's hopeless. Romans 15 4, what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. God gave us the Bible so we could have hope. So don't sit here and think your life is hopeless because it's not. If you think your life is hopeless, you're not reading the Bible. You're not reading the Bible. This book is a book full of hope. Don't sit here and think I am a worthless person. You are not. You're not. Look at the cross that he gave, that he went to for you. Look at the Bible. It's for you. Look at heaven. It's for you. Look at it. Don't sit here and think, I've blown my chance. You may have missed opportunities, but you didn't blow your chance because we have the God of the second chance. We have the God of the third chance. We have the God of the fourth chance. God keeps giving chances to us. Jonah saw the God of the second chance. Peter, the apostle, saw the God of the second chance. Paul, the apostle, experienced many times the God of the second and the third chances. David saw God give him many chances. Moses saw God put up with his failures and give him many, many chances to keep doing what he was supposed to do. <clears throat> so you missed opportunities. You say, well, I haven't lived my life like I should have. I've not I've been the kind of Christian I should be. I've, I've not surrendered to God like I should. I've not done it. I'm not reading my Bible like I should. I'm not praying like I should. I'm not witnessing to people like I should. I'm not faithful to church like I should be. I haven't, I'm not doing God's plan for my life like I should be. You, you say, I missed these opportunities. You got another chance right now. You have another chance right now. Will you take advantage of it? You know what you need to do? Listen to me carefully and I'll be done. Quit believing the whispers from hell. And start believing the words from heaven. Amen. Quit believing the whispers from hell and start believing the words from heaven. You see, you are. You are worth a lot. God has proved that by his investments in your life. Wow, it's amazing. It's amazing. I have some really, really good friends in my life since I got saved. And one of the ways I know they're my good friends is what they've invested in me. I know I'm important to them. I know my family's important to them because they've invested a lot. A lot of time in prayer and a lot of, lot of, lot of other things they gave to me in their life. I know that. And I know I'm important to God. I know that. I know I'm important to God. No one can, can make me think any differently because he invested in me a plan the plan, the only plan of salvation. He invested in me a plan for my life, a purpose for my life. He invested a path for me to follow. He invested that in me. He wrote a book of direction for me and kept it pure all these years so I would have a perfect one. And he's preparing a place for me even now. Wow. What am I going to do about that? I just going to go home and live my life like that's none of that's really true? Or am I going to show God 
I'm really grateful. God, you're amazing. You would care that much about me? Boy, if you're going to invest that in me, I'm going to give my life and invest it in you and all, every, all the work you, you, want, you want me to do in my life, with my life. All right, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you for this amazing truth. Lord, help us to quit believing the whispers from hell, the whispers from Satan and his demons, the whispers from the world, and start believing the words that you gave us from heaven. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. <clears throat> so I ask you this morning, will you lose your life and give it up? Give up what you want and give it to God. Will you do that this morning? Will you lose your life and give it up? Give up what you want and give it to God. Will you do that? Have you ever done that? Will you do that this morning? I'm going to decide this morning to give up my wants and my desires, find out what God's plan is, what God's purpose is for me, and I'm going to go with that. I'm going to quit walking my path and walk his path. I'm going to quit believing the words from the world and start believing the words from heaven. I'm going to get ready to live in that wonderful place God is preparing for me. Now, if you're not sure you're saved, why don't you decide this morning to find out about this plan of salvation that God invested in you. The Father gave his son for you. Jesus gave his life for you. Even right now, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about your need of salvation. And you need to take care of that before you leave this room so you can have eternal life. You see, because the Bible says you need that, the Bible says you don't know when you're going to die, so you have a chance right now to receive God's gift of eternal life. If you don't know how to do that, we'll be glad to take the Bible and show you how. Heads about eyes closed. How many say this morning, Pastor, I know for sure when I die that I'm going to heaven because one day I saw in God's word, the Bible, I saw that I was a sinner on my way to hell. I saw that Jesus loved me and he died for my sins. He paid the penalty for my sins. I saw that he bought me the gift of eternal life, that I could not earn my way to heaven. It was a gift that Jesus purchased with his own life. I saw that he rose from the dead and I called on him and asked him to save me. And because I did that, I know for sure I'm going to heaven when I die. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Let me see it. I know for sure I'm going to heaven when I die. You may lower your hands. How many say this morning, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. <clears throat> I'd like to be saved. I'd like to go to heaven when I die. But right now, I don't know that for sure. I don't have any peace in my heart about that. I doubt whether or not heaven's going to be my home when I die. I'd like it to be, but I'm not 100% sure. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I'm not 100% sure I'd like to be, but I'm not. In just a moment, we're going to have a song of invitation. And when the song begins, we're going to invite you. If you're not sure you're saved, not sure you're going to heaven when you die, leave your seat, come up front, tell Brother Kevin that. He'll direct you to somebody. He'll take the Bible and show you God's plan of salvation, the plan of salvation that he made just for you so you could be saved, so you could go to heaven when you die. Somebody will take the Bible and show you that amazing plan. If you are saved, the next thing God wants you to do after salvation is to get baptized. And so if you've not been baptized since you've been saved, you can do that today. We have everything ready for you. Just leave your seat, walk up to Kevin and say, I've been saved, but I've not obeyed God and followed, uh, followed him in baptism. Since I got saved, I'd like to do that today. Tell Kevin that, we'll be glad to help you. If you're saved and baptized, you want to join the church, come up and tell Kevin you'd like to do that. But if God spoke to your heart this morning and you want to surrender everything to him you want to give him. if he's invested that much in you if you're that important to him you want to surrender your life to him you come and tell him that at this altar let's all stand obey the holy spirit as he speaks to your heart you do what he tells you to do if you're not if you need to surrender do it now as the song begins